Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, welcome, um, welcome to the uh, Weitzman School of Design. For those of you who are visiting tonight, uh, I'm Fritz Steiner, and I have the honor of serving as the school's dean and also Paley professor. Um, tonight's talk is one of a series of uh, thought-provoking programs on the built environment and the arts that we'll be presenting uh, over the months to come. Uh, and there's a, a fold-out guide, I, I believe, over by the entrance, which um, has uh, the future lectures. And so if you're not familiar with them, please take one uh, or also consult our web website. Uh, our speaker tonight is um, A. Eugene Cohn, uh, the founder and um, uh, chairman of KPF. And uh, he's, a two, he's a Philadelphian and a two-time graduate of our school. Um, and Gene has um, been um, an incredible example uh, for an alum, alumnus to move uh, our professions uh, forward uh, and to give uh, back to the community from where they started. Um, he has been on our board of overseers for many years and also served on the university's uh, board of trustees. Uh, Gene uh, earned both his bachelor's and master's degree in uh, architecture from Penn. Uh, he served uh, in the U.S. Navy uh, for three years in, in between those uh, degrees. Uh, he then spent uh, five years on reserve duty and retired as a lieutenant commander. Uh, he's a uh, licensed art architect in 26 states, um, a fellow of the American Institute of Architects, a member of the Royal Institute of British Architects, a member of the Jap Jap Japan Institute of Architects, um, and an honorary member of the Fellows of the Philippine Institute. Uh, he is a emeritus trustee of the National Building Museum and the Urban Land Institute. And I'm guessing there's not too many people who have taught both at the Harvard Business School and the Graduate School of Design, but Gene has. Um, in fact, he is an executive fellow of the Graduate School uh, at Harvard, um, the first architect to be awarded this title, and he's also uh, taught uh, at Columbia. I'm not going to go through all the honors that Gene has won. There's a, a whole bunch. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all the buildings that he's designed because there's a, a lot. Um, but I just want to maybe mention two buildings. Um, the first is a building to come. Um, ground is broken uh, fairly recently in Center City, Philadelphia, uh, across from uh, the Kimball uh, on a new 47-story um, 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 development in, uh, on, on South Broad Street. So um, that's something to pay attention to here in the, the months to come. Um, for me, um, and thinking of uh, Gene's amazing, as a young designer and, and how important uh, KPF was, um, uh, one, one building in particular um, really um, sort of brought home how important architecture is. Um, and I'm, many of you know, from Ohio and spent a long time in Cincinnati. And when Procter & Gamble decided to build their uh, corporate headquarters in downtown Cincinnati, it was um, a remarkable statement and a commitment um, by um, the, the anchor employer of Cincinnati to commit to the future of Cincinnati. Um, Cincinnati, um, like many uh, Rust Belt cities, have had its challenges, uh, but that move, that very important building, um, br breathed new life into um, downtown Cincinnati. Uh, really, one of the reasons we're here tonight, uh, and we invited Gene, is not his buildings, but his most recent book, or his recent book, uh, The World by Design, uh, which he wrote uh, with Clifford uh, Pearson, who's with us tonight as well. I, I, I've read a lot of books on architecture. I've read a lot of books on design. I've never read anything like this. 
uh, and I, I mean that in the best possible way. Uh, this is not a glossy recounting of uh, amazing projects literally all around the world. It's a very honest and candor uh, about running a business. Um, and it's full of self-deprecating humor uh, and really generous uh, um, acknowledgments of uh, that architecture is really a team process and the role that his colleagues and partners and uh, many people played in the success of uh, KPF. And he doesn't uh, mince words about when things didn't go as well. Uh, so it, I think it's one of those books that um, is going to have a, lot, a lasting power because, um, again, I've never read anything quite like it. Uh, I think it fills a gap in the literature about uh, what does it take to uh, conceive and build and, and maintain a practice uh, over decades, over continents, um, at, at a really high quality. Uh, so um, this book is uh, terrific. and. Um, I, I think it's one that uh, I would certainly recommend to, to um, put on your shelf. Um, we have a bookseller here tonight, so you can actually get a signed copy after the talk. Uh, so with that, it's uh, a great pleasure to uh, really introduce a, a legend uh, in architecture and certainly here in Philadelphia and at Penn, Gene Cohn. That was great. Uh, <clears throat> everybody here? Okay, I've had a little trouble with my voice, so I'm speaking as loudly as I can. Well, tonight I'm going to do a talk that's not just about architecture, but about creating architecture firm, as well as how you do the projects and how you win the projects. And it's all about stories. And uh, some of the stories end well, and some of them don't. But uh, that's part of being an architect and part of our, our life. So uh, I. I'm going to try to be brief about certain things, and uh, if you read the book, you'll get all the answers. But uh, it's, it's a fun read. People read it. Uh, one of my professors at Harvard uh, read it in a day and a half. He said he so enjoyed it. He couldn't put it down. It's like an adventure or a novel. So, okay. Um, oops. First mistake is to leave your phone on. Sorry. <laughs> Apologize. Okay. Um, I have my grandson, Harry, here, who's uh, uh, not an architect, but a very good student, a senior here at Penn, so he's going to keep track of me and make sure I say the right thing. Uh, how many of you know our firm or know of our firm? Okay, good. So, uh, <laughs> I just want to be sure. <laughs> uh, so let me start this way. Um, we, uh, if I were to give you the statistics of the firm, just to start, Today, we're a firm of 730 people. We have eight office, nine offices in eight countries. And um, we have worked in over 40 countries. And uh, our biggest practices right now are China, all through Asia, and of course, the US. Uh, we've done every building type. And uh, our offices are primarily offices in New York and our other design offices in London. And then we have offices throughout Asia and a bit of Europe and Berlin, et cetera. So it's a big firm, but we didn't start that way. And very honestly, I never had a dream that we'd be that big. I was happy if we could reach 100. But uh, when you're doing well and you have a bunch of aggressive partners, you can become much larger. And if the market's good. So, but I thought in telling you about the stories of how we grew, how we became a firm, would be of interest. So, um, but first, let me show you on the map the range of our work, where our offices are, and uh, where we tend to work. But you can see it's a pretty large area of the U.S. and the world. Um, we're for, and these are all statistics, so I'm not going to spend time on it. But it's all about team. And one of the features in the book for me was that architecture is not a one-person thing. I mean, we, you know, we tend to judge buildings by the name of one architect, the name, and they're very good ones. It could be Foster, Rogers, it could be uh, Gary, et cetera. But the reality is that those firms all have many talented people and partners who are doing the work. It's not one person. 
And so I wanted to be sure that we would be giving credit to all of the partners who do the work and not take it for myself, and I could have, because I started the firm. Uh, but we started on, as you'll see shortly, on July 4th, 1976. But most recently, I did this, my firm has done this statistic, we've done six, six of the 11 tallest buildings in the world. And they're uh, all very excellent buildings, in my opinion. Uh, all mostly through the Asia, and, uh, mostly Asia, mostly China. Um, but how did we start? So uh, this is my mother. My mother was a fashion designer, f excellent artist, had a show at the Guggenheim when she reached 100. But what her, she was the influence. My father wanted me to be a doctor. My mother was my influence for the arts. And, um, and through her, I, I became interested in the arts and really then developed a desire to be an architect. But uh, she was very, very creative. And um, I learned how she handled people. She treated everybody with respect, no matter their role, no matter their color, their religion, always with respect. And the other thing I, I, I remember distinctly growing up with it was that when a woman put on one of her dresses and said, Hannah, I have to buy this, and she wouldn't sell it to them, I'd say, but mother, they want to buy the dress. She said, but Jean, it's the wrong dress for her. One day she discovered, I know it, I can't sell it. And that developed an ethic that I think also works in architecture and, and, and morality. So my mother played a very big influence for me. Um, Paul Rudolph was the next one. When I came to Penn, I wasn't sure I wanted to be an architect. And, um, but the dean said, why don't you study architecture? No matter whether you become an architect or not, it's a great education. And so um, one of the, the first person who really influenced me about architecture was Paul Rudolph. And he came, and there was a young man. He had just been successful in Sarasota, Florida, doing beautiful houses, but hadn't taught. And, uh, we, and, and he was single, so we all on weekends would travel and see other buildings, and he took us to see Philip Johnson and his house in New Canaan. So he, he, he inspired you. He got you excited about being an architect. He would sit at your desk and sketch and draw, and uh, I wish I could just do the same. So he got me excited. And then uh, the Navy played a big role in my life. I served during the Korean War, and uh, why the Navy did was not about creativity, although it was about leadership. It was about management. It was about how you treat people and how you plan for the future. And so as an officer, uh, I learned a great deal about planning, making decision making. And Shelley Fox and I were both, a, he was a, in the Army as an officer and I was in the Navy. But we both learned how to make decisions. I can make a decision in one minute, one second, and look at both sides. It's critical before you make a decision always to look at both sides of the coin. And so through the Navy, that experience was very important. I actually spent eight years in the Navy, but uh, three on active duty. So. Um, then coming back to Penn uh, to, to um, get my graduate degree, I studied with Lou Kahn. And uh, Lou Kahn was one of the most inspirational people I'd ever met. And uh, he inspired all of us at Penn. Lou Kahn could speak for four hours and you dare not leave to go to the bathroom because you'd miss something very important. And, uh, and Lou would take you on tours of his buildings. He would talk to the contractors, the bricklayers. He'd say, explain what a brick wants to be. And I remember these contractors who were tough cookies, you know, all of a sudden just couldn't get over Lou Kahn and they got more inspired to do good work than ever before. So he was a, a marvelous man. He did have one fault though. He, if he didn't like the work you were doing, he would not critique you. And I had a classmate who had studied undergrad with Bruce Goff. And Lou said, I can't help you. <laughs> if you stick with Bruce Goff, I can't help you. And so he never critiqued him. I happened to like his work, and he liked what I was doing, so we got along great. But, um, um, I worked for some fine architects. Well, actually, Ian McCarg had come to Penn during the graduate time. He was also inspirational. He was a charming and inspirational man with his landscape and really elevated the landscape architecture of Penn. Um, my first job was with Vincent Kling, and uh, I became a designer under Vince, and Vince was, a, I thought, an excellent architect and had a great firm. And he uh, was fantastic in getting work, but also in overseeing the work, and he had the ability to convince clients of anything he wanted. I mean, I'll tell you very quickly, I was designing a school at Marietta College, and uh, Vince, of course, did all the presents and presenting. And he'd make you put the first scheme down on the, on the model, 
on budget, had all the program, all the things you needed. And then after you finished describing, he would then flick it with his wrist and knock it to the floor. And people would say, what is he doing? Then he put the second model down. This was a little more expensive, a little more inventive, more creative, et cetera. And he would explain it, did the same thing. And then he put the third one down. Now, the third one was considerably over budget, very handsome, met the program, and he would sit back like this and said, that's your building. And normally they would do it. I couldn't get over it. <laughs> they would buy it. But he was so good at presenting. And uh, so I learned a great deal from, from Vince. Um, I then worked for Jack Warnicke. I became president of the firm, which was a global firm at the time, primarily throughout the U.S. and Iran at the time. And, uh, Italy. And I, I learned a great deal with Jack, both what to do and not to do, and uh, spent nine years with him. And then decided after working with Jack uh, to start my own firm, which I did in July 4th, 1976. A key date. In fact, the city of New York celebrated. I know that Marilyn remembers this. The tall ships sailed up the Hudson and uh, giant fireworks at night. And uh, it's great to have your firm uh, recognized and launched on that note. And every birthday they do it. Here we are. I, I always show this picture because I say, who in the world would hire these three guys? I mean, uh, <laughs> but uh, to, my, to the right is Bill Pedersen. Shelly Fox is in the middle. And uh, I had gray hair back then as well. I'm um, off to the left. So. We, this building I show you was a building for, that we had commissioned. Uh, we were selected while at Warnicke. So I give Warnicke credit. But Bill and I actually won the project and worked on the design. It was for a company called AAL. And uh, they wanted to have all open plan. This goes back 45, 50 years. They wanted all open plan so they could expand the building, shrink the building, whatever, without taking away windows from those who were working. So an uh, interesting idea. And so um, it's a two-story building, basically one story with some two-story elements. And uh, it's really, it was all about the work environment and how people work together, team, the kind of facilities for restaurants, et cetera. We learned a great deal about corporate buildings with this one, because we, working with the chairman who wanted all open plan, all landscape open plan, uh, we really understood how people could work together in these kind of environments. So a great first project, and there is in the fields of Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, and the interior is quite interesting. So the skylights were on either side of that rounded element that you see, uh, where the, uh, all the air conditioning was in that element in the center of that space, and then light daylight to the sides. So, well, how did we really get started? So that was a project for Warnicke, but that helped us get our thoughts about corporate work. Um, so when we started the firm on July 4th, 1976, those of you who are too young, you don't remember, this is one of the worst economic periods. In, six, in 73, the economy crashed. And by 76, 60% 60 of architects were unemployed with no work. And here I am leaving Warnicke as president to start a firm. My mother and father said, you are absolutely crazy. You know, why are you leaving to start a firm in this horrible economic climate? So I did a little research. And if you look back at the Depression, which I was actually born in, um, you um, realize that firms who started during the years of the Depression could go nowhere but up. As the economy improved, they were already part of the scene, and they benefited from that. So we thought we'd take the chance. But we had no work. And then we got a phone call uh, I did from a, a bank in Iran, because I had been doing work there. And the chairman said, hey, we'd like you to do our new headquarters. And um, he said, I'm going to pay you for the design, $1.3 million. This is 1976. For pe we had no money and no, f no jobs. It sounded pretty good. Right? But a friend of mine, when I had asked for advice, told me, he said, Gene, the key to your success will be the work you turn down. Now, it occurred to me that maybe we should turn this down, but because I had worked in Iran, and it was not easy to work there. And uh, travel was difficult, and getting paid was equally difficult, and so forth and so on. So, uh, but you know, we had no other choice. Uh, thought it over, discussed it with Bill and Shelley, and came to the conclusion we should turn it down. And I still remember the Saturday in his kitchen, holding on to the, Sunday rather, holding on to the refrigerator and calling Iran and turning this job down, and $1.3 million of potential fee. But we felt better after that. But I looked in the newspaper, Sunday Times, and in the Sunday Times was a little article 
The American Broadcasting Company, the third network after CBS and NBC, had bought an armory on the Upper West Side on 63rd between Central Park West and Columbus. And I knew a VP there, and Shelley knew a VP there, so we called and we said, uh, we'd love to do this building. And he said, well, tell us about your firm. I said, well, we're a new firm, but, you know, we're all senior and we can, I mean, there's three of us, you know. So uh, we finally convinced him we got an interview and we were selected. Now, if we had failed, we were the only one they interviewed. It would not have been a good thing. But we did win the interview. This project, okay, was a key. It's like when you look back in your life and you come to a crossroad and you have to make a decision. Do I go this way or this way? Had we gone to Iran, the Shah was booted out six months later, nobody got paid for anything, and the project would have been dead, we would have had no work. We had this building, and they paid a very good fee, and they paid within 10 days of when you build them. We ended up with 17 projects for the American Broadcasting Company, and, uh, well, these are some of them, and then we were contacted by the developer of this building, which we designed in Chicago called 333 Wacker Drive. So here we are in 1977, designing this building in Chicago. Now, as Marilyn will tell you, Chicago architects do not like New York architects coming into their domain. And, uh, they were, and here we are working with Perkins and Will, who are doing the working drawings, and we're the design architect. And um, we get a chance to design this, but ABC decides not to move. The reason, but I didn't tell you, the reason we were called was they thought, because we worked for ABC, that I could convince ABC to lease their building, which was a lot to assume, since I didn't have that kind of influence on ABC. But nevertheless, we, took, we got the job, and they fell in love with the building. But ABC didn't take the building, because they stayed where they were. But a year or two later, uh, the, the client had put this building's model on his shelf above his desk, and he loved the building. And he said, Gene, we're going to build it on spec. And so we got a chance to do a million square foot building in Chicago on the river, you know, among all the great architects who worked in Chicago, and it became a famous building. And it still is today. And we got to, as a result, this really got us kicked off. I mean, on a great kick off, not kicked off, but good kick start, whatever. <laughs> uh, here is the other shots. Many of you may know it. It led, however, to a lot of other things. So the press we got, Paul Goldberger reviewed and many other people, was so good that we all of a sudden got on a list for Procter & Gamble's world headquarters. Now, we're a young firm. And uh, I, I'm sorry, Marilyn, but we did go up against SOM and IM Pay for this. And uh, we were finally selected to do Procter & Gamble. We did the entire architecture and interiors, a major, major commission, working for John Smale and Brad Butler, who were the president and, C and the chairman. It was a major job because everybody somehow ended up in Procter & Gamble trying to sell something so they would see our building, and it led to a lot of other work. Um, um, and then we got, uh, uh, interesting enough, invited to a competition for the World Bank in Washington. And um, this was a major, major project, and hundreds of architects competed. Bill didn't want to do this. I said, well, let's give it a try. He said, yeah, but, you know, it's an open competition to the world. Everybody, why would they pick us? Well, they picked eight, and we were one of the eight finalists. And uh, this team won. Um, I won't keep you in suspense. This one won. And um, we were able to do two things. There were four buildings that made up the, uh, I don't think, it, well, four buildings that made up this project originally, the World Bank, done by four different architects. One was by SOM, by Bunchev. One was by Vincent Kling. And those two buildings we kept. We were the only architects we kept two of the buildings, reskinned them and, and worked with them to fit the new plan, and then developed the new parts of the structure with two new buildings and this fantastic atrium that uh, was 150 feet high that is the center for the bank, and today is as, is as exciting as it was then. So that was a major project to win. And then uh, we got interviewed by IBM. This is all because of the decision to do ABC's building. Okay, and then do Wacker as a result of that. So if you look back in your life, you say, if I had gone to, as I mentioned, to Iran, all this would have been, never happened. But because we didn't, and we stayed and did that building for ABC, we ended up uh, with all these commissions. So we got interviewed here, and uh, a lucky break took place, because again, tough competition 
There's so many good architects that you're lucky to win these jobs. But we, we won this by uh, uh, not only the scheme, but uh, the night before we were interviewed, I was invited to a dinner party by a woman who I was not too particularly fond of, but I said, I probably won't go. And uh, my wife was away, and I was I'm not going to go. And then I decided to go because I had nothing else to do. And I ended up sitting next to the, uh, a man who had been the number two man to Lou Gerstner at Nabisco. And he knew all about Lou's quirks. And so over dinner, he says, Gene, I'll give you some advice. Lou Gerstner is not an easy man to present to. He will interrupt you many times intentionally to see how you respond. And he said, um, he's going to interrupt you for sure. If you're showing PowerPoint slides, he's not going to let you finish. Don't get upset. Just put it away and do whatever he asks. If you don't, you'll never get the job. So sure enough, we put this PowerPoint together, and we did some little schemes. <laughs> we put three, not even three quarters, halfway through the PowerPoint, he said, that, don't show me that stuff. I don't want to see that stuff. <laughs> we turned it off. And we brought out the little models that we had studied for him. And he got really interested in that. And we got selected. My, if I hadn't gone to that dinner, there's no way we would have re responded the way we did. So lucky break. Um, you know, as an architect, uh, we work all over the world. I always say it would be fun to do an airport. But we had no experience. So the Buffalo Airport, which is not a major airport, but a nice size, came up. And this is many years ago, and, uh, in 1997. Uh, and um, I joined, I, I got two other architects, a local architect and somebody who had done airports, and we teamed up. And we won this airport, which, you know, is very handsome, very simple, which has given us the experience. When you go through security, you end up going through the tail of the plane, and it's a little dangerous with the jet I'm, I'm teasing. Um, but, uh, okay. Um, so now we're, we're now wearing not T-shirts, but suits. And uh, this is Shelley to the left, Bill Patterson sitting and myself to the right, designing a building that uh, we didn't win, but uh, for 383 uh, Madison Avenue. Uh, and um, so in 1985, I'm moving quickly because I'm going to get through. In 1985, I was at a conference uh, in, I know Maryland was probably the same one, in uh, Cal for the ULI in San Francisco. And an economist spoke, very good economist, and he said, to all the people in the room who are architects, developers, engineers, bankers, if you're not global by 1990, half of you will be out of business. I believed them. So I went back to my partners, Bill and Shelley, and I said, Bill, we, Shelley, we really need to get global. He said, no way. It's tough enough doing work in New York or Cincinnati or Cleveland. What do we want to go to Europe for or Asia? I said, guys, this is a very good economist. I think he's correct. We should go global. So I took it upon myself uh, to go to London. And uh, I managed to, I knew the head of real estate for Goldman Sachs. And I talked to him about it. And he said, well, we're, we're planning a building. We'll, we'll give you a chance to interview you. And so we got interviewed. And this is the most historic area of London, the oldest bar in the world, in probably the world, but certainly London is next to this building. Uh, we, uh, we got selected by Goldman Sachs to do this building. And Genzer did the interiors. And that started us in London. Uh, shortly after, for some reason, we got asked to compete with a near number of German architects for this building in Frankfurt, uh, called the DG Bank, and uh, designed a, a tower that really was very unique for them. And we won this competition. And this tower got built eventually. And uh, several others we got in Europe, we, including Canary Wharf. Skimmer only in Maryland was working for Canary Wharf. And we were fortunate to get selected to do one or two of the buildings. I think over time did more. But all of a sudden, we had three major projects, and we're in London, and we opened an office. And uh, that office grew, and it's been very successful. Uh, we work all through Europe with it. So um, and then Asia, we were very fortunate. Uh, a J Japanese company called Taisei, a very large construction company with architects, and they do development. Uh, we worked for in Chicago with a local developer. And they liked working with us. And they asked us if we would come to Japan and meet with them. And they would do a, we would do a project together in Tokyo. So we, uh, Paul Katz unfortunately passed away. And I flew to Japan and met with them. And they said, well, we know, unfortunately, we're not going to do that project. But we're going to recommend you for one in Nagoya. And I said, oh, you know, I'm disappointed because I'm going to work for them. He said, but you go down to Nagoya, and they'll talk to you about it. Turned out to be 5 million square feet. It was 
a train station with major buildings of retail, of office, hotel, and retail, and you see it on the screen, um, as, the, as the building, over the tracks. These are all over tracks. And so here we, we get interviewed and we, we get selected, and then negotiating the fee was a bit difficult, but nevertheless, that all worked out, and this was our first project in Asia. And mo to start with a five million square foot project is, uh, uh, I think, pretty impressive. <laughs> Uh, and then these were others that for uh, Ronnie Chan in Hong Kong, uh, a very large project called Plaza 66, which is two office buildings and retail. We're still a young firm, by the way, guys, and we're still growing. You know, we're not big, big. And then for me, uh, this was probably a, the most enjoyable one. A very famous developer in Japan, named Mr. Mori, who was uh, his, his father, right after World War II, was the wealthiest man in the world at 17 billion and he was in real estate as well as uh, teaching. And um, it took six tries to get to meet him. Now you can't call, you can't go to Japan and call up a client and say, I'm in town, I'd love to meet you. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. One, you have to be introduced. Two, you have to develop a relationship before they do it. So after six meetings with Mr. Mari Jr., the son, he, s he arranged for me to meet his father so that we could work for them. And we'd be interviewed by his father. So. Uh, these are all stories in the book, so it's all about stories. But he, uh, so I went to meet senior Mr. Mari, who was still dr dressed in traditional Japanese clothing and had a, a man who carried his silver tray with his card on it. And we went into the conference room, just the three of us. And uh, for, I, I thought it would be a half hour. You know, what, what could he ask me? And he started asking questions. And I answered best I could. And uh, one hour goes by, and I said, geez, we had made the mistake of making other meetings for that day. He assumed it would be not that long. And of course, now it's an hour and a half. And I said, gee, what, when, what's, the, what's the question? Yet? Finally, just before the two hour mark, Mr. Smarry Sr. said, Mr. Cohn, what can you do for us? Now he's the wealthiest man in the world, <laughs> a very successful. I said, Mr. Mari, we can't do anything for you, but I think working together, we can do some wonderful things. That apparently was the answer. And we got selected for the project you see on the screen, which is Rapungi Hills. That building is like a sumo wrestler of buildings. It's 60,000 square foot floor plates that rise the full height of the building. So it's an amazing building. Um, and then we did a hotel and other buildings as part of this. Mr. Mari took over 30 years to assemble this site. He bought, he bought it piece by piece. But it's an outstanding location and it's done extremely well. And there's a wonderful Hyatt Hotel, there are movie theaters, there's retail, et cetera. A number of architects worked on this, but we, we were the planner with the, uh, and the architects for the major tower and the hotel. The building that probably, again, put us on the map in Asia is this building called the Shanghai World Financial Center. And um, uh, Mr. Mari was again the developer. And this is interesting because it has a political overtone. Uh, that is, we did this building, uh, and the original design at the very top, because of, the thought was if we could have a big opening in this building to allow the wind through, we could reduce some of the structural costs of this very tall building, one of the tallest in the world. And uh, we had a circle. And we did it for the fact that in Japan, um, the moon gate is very important. Number two, uh, in mythology, they view the sky as a circle, round. And uh, unity is also part of that. And um, we thought this would be really impressive. And uh, the, mayor seemed, the mayor of Shanghai loved the building. In fact, he made it taller, but he wouldn't approve it, which is the most unusual thing I've ever seen. Makes it taller and doesn't approve it. And uh, one, a whole year goes by, and he calls up and he asks us to fly over and meet with him, which we do. And he says, uh, you keep calling that the moon gate. He said, but to us, that's the rising sun, and the rising sun will not fly over China again. So to correct that or we can't build the building. So what you see today is the building that was actually done in the opening that was created. And the bridge that goes across the top is all glass. And when you look, get on the, what's interesting, at either end is a high-speed elevator. But when you get off that top, you walk across to see all of Shanghai. But we don't realize that the floor is all glass. And you can see all the way down. <laughs> and as people, it's really, they start to walk off the elevator and they look down and they stop and they start to back up. 
because they're, uh, think, <laughs> they're a little bit afraid of the glass floor. But it becomes a very exciting place to actually view, view Shanghai, sunset. Um, then, in, in, uh, so this is what's happened. I'm, I'm doing now is just tracing in the order it happened the major commissions we received and the story of those commissions. So this is a building called ICC, and it's uh, on Hong Kong Island, and it's over all the transportation that connects to mainland China, uh, to Hong Kong, the island as well, and connects to the airport. Um, so this building is one of the tallest in the world. In fact, there's a bar at the 118th floor, and it's the only place I know you can get high without drinking. Bad joke. Uh, uh, you guys not have uh, no humor? <laughs> no, not too much. Okay. So um, this building is office. But what's interesting about this, I want to point out, is it was built. Um, can anybody see that? Well, you see there are three divisions, actually, where the mechanical occurs. You can see that by the openings. Uh, okay. They built this in stages. And the first building is the lower one. It was completed for Morgan Stanley with its own independent mechanical systems, air, et cetera. So they were getting income from the lowest part of this building while they were building above. Now, in the States, it's really hard to do this, for safety reason, but they were able to do it here. So each one of those were pre-leased, Morgan Stanley being one of them. Uh, Deutsche Bank was another, and uh, at the very top is the Ritz Hotel. So we were able to get, they were able to get income as we built this building. Now, it slowed it down a bit because you had to do certain things for precaution. But the reality was it was a financially a good thing for them, and they got the building they wanted called the ICC. Cesar Pelli has done an equally handsome, a very handsome building across the way. And that building, um, they form like a goalpost. <laughs> they're equally the same. It's a little taller, but they're pretty close to each other. And then an interesting building in, in Hong Kong, and, and, was this one, where we were um, building in a very dense area of Hong Kong, and the air movement was a problem. And so this is a building where we opened up the building, put holes in the building, so air could move through and get the streets um, having movement of the, of the air for more comfort. And it's a building that has half retail, half office, with a, really in the, in the midsection, I shouldn't say half, in the midsection could go all office or all retail, but it would split the building one way in half. So either half retail, half office, or a little bit more office and less retail. But it's a, been a very successful building. You see that here in section um, with the retail, restaurants, et cetera, uh, in brown and with the landscape, and then the office above, and then the big atriums. And, uh, for a company called Lotte in Korea, this is a company that started by making chiclets. And they've, they've actually grown since that time. And this building is one of the tallest in the world and called the Latte Tower. And its base has concert hall, meeting rooms, it's a hotel, it's office, it's retail, uh, has all kinds of spaces. So very successful building. Unfortunately, there was a moment uh, where they had the, the Korean government, South Korean government, wanted us to study putting a cannon, I'm, I'm not kidding now, at the very top in that slot. This is when North Korea was threatening. And they wanted to be able to fire back. I said, you can't do that. You'll make a target of this building. It'd be, it'd be ridiculous. You know? Plus, firing a cannon from that roof is going to cause a movement that we hadn't planned for. So we, we talked that out of it. Now, this last part of the show is about uh, what I call uh, repositioning buildings, uh, restoration, uh, reskinning, whatever. There are different names. But for all of you, when the economy starts to slow, as I, I believe it's going to be doing soon, uh, or we get into an overbuilt situation, one of the first things real estate developers do and companies is redo buildings they own. They either reskin them, do a new lobby, make adjustments, or do some extreme things as I'm about to show you. So this is a building for Unilever, uh, and it was their headquarters building in 1920. And uh, they had decided they needed new space so the question was, do they redo this building, create something different, or do they move? Now, economically, there's no question in my mind they should have moved. But what they chose to do is to keep it and make a much better building. So this was our challenge. So that was the types of spaces, their office space, their, well, these aren't even atriums, they're just really courtyards that are pretty deadly. And um, so we went in and uh, ripped out the entire interior. Just and one of the walls, as you'll see, and redid a new atrium. 
that has what we call flying carpets in for you to go out of those flying carpets and have a cup of coffee or talk to your friend and then go back to work in a totally open plan floor. And uh, what used to be a solid wall uh, is now all glass looking over the city of London. So when you get off the elevator, you come into this grand space with yellow columns and great views, and it's, it makes you feel good to be here. In fact, the building is so popular, it's overcrowded now. And uh, one of the nice things was the executives used to have the top floor and this deck for lunch and their meetings. They gave it to the employees. They moved to the middle of the building, and they made the top for the employees' dining and relaxation and so forth. A very nice gesture. And a very, this is a you know, wonderful, except when it's kind of windy, but good views from here. Uh, this is an interesting building called Heron Tower. And it was based upon a concept I don't really think is a good idea that we had. And that is, decided to make this into three-story chunks. In other words, create a space of three floors. So the, ground, one, the first floor is full floor. The two above are U-shaped, creating an atrium. That sounds good, and the developer was very excited about it. But as I began to think about it and question, unfortunately, he liked it so much we built it. But in my opinion, it doesn't make a lot of sense because you have to get a tenant that's three stories in their need, or six, or, but a multiple of three. If you get them for one and two, if you have the guy on the first, the tenant on the first floor has people looking down into their atrium, so they lose the privacy. So while it leased well, and, and I guess it's been a success, I've never been totally convinced this was a good idea. Uh, it wasn't my idea, so I'm being critical of somebody else's, but. Uh, it, to me, it, it, it was, uh, it, I mean, actually, in the Gherkin, Foster did it with six stories, but it was for a corporation. Unfortunately, they didn't take it. So you had the same problem of six-story atriums that are air-conditioned that way, and you have two tenants, and it becomes difficult. Um, um, so while it's a very pleasant atrium space at three stories, uh, it has its own difficulties. Um, this one is a, a one we just won an award for called, in Covent Garden. You know, I keep showing these large projects, and we've been fortunate to do them, but this is one of my favorite because the scale is quite small. Uh, Coven, how many of you have been to Covent Garden in London? Okay, well, you, well, not too many, but you experience the, uh, the scale and the delicacy of it. And uh, this is what it, some of the circulation that looks like going to the square, I'll show you in a moment. That re residential building at the end uh, is one I show when we show the big towers because we don't just do big towers. I mean. Uh, I said, you know, we, we do buildings that are much smaller and that really are very sensitive. This is a residential building that's so expensive. Uh, they're great. Every floor is sold but the penthouse, which is priced ridiculously high, but beautiful space. Uh, the floral court is this as well. So it's a courtyard uh, with uh, retail and restaurants around at the base and then residential above, a different scale. And um, we just won the National AI Award for this one. Uh, which is a really spectacular space, and I had a book party here, so I have good memories of this place. <laughs> okay. Um, for me, personally, I enjoy working on corporate buildings more than developer buildings, because corporate buildings, you talk about work environment, concept of how these companies are managed, led, and work together. And so over the years, we pursued and been fortunate to win some. Um, so I thought my phone was, I apologize. Okay, that time is up. Um, so this one uh, for Gannett is really uh, two buildings. One is for USA Today, which they own, and the other is for Gannett's headquarters. And the whole idea was to have the two facing inward, and all the common spaces that relate to both buildings is between the two buildings. And, um, okay, I'm moving quickly because sorry, I just want to have, leave time for questions. Uh, uh, this one is called Baruch College. And, one of our favorite buildings uh, in terms of idea. Uh, not all has worked out as I'd hope, but this one is the here's original sketch by Bill Patterson, who is a brilliant, brilliant designer and my wonderful partner friend. And um, this building has uh, three schools within it. So there's three different schools, all belonging to Baruch, but like one is, uh, is a business school and one is for English and so forth. And so how do you create three schools within this space and make them tie together visually. And so through atriums and allowing the sun to penetrate and give daylight to this building, I was, well, this will give you some idea of the different spaces. 
And so we use escalators, elevators, and stairs for the circulation so that people can get to class on time. Uh, it, I should have shown you more uh, possibilities there, but it's a wonderful building functionally. And um, unfortunately, there was no budget for maintenance, so it really is not well maintained, unfortunately. It's not cleaned, I mean, so that's a bit of a problem. But uh, inside works really well and is functionally doing very well. Um, I, I've been teaching at Harvard at the business school and design school for many years, and Bill Pedersen was one of my guests, so uh, he's to the right. And uh, Bill, unfortunately, lost his wife recently. But I have to tell you, he's one of the most brilliant design partners you could ever want, and one of the nicest people you can meet. So I'm going to use this slide for what's been important to me and the firm and that's in the book, uh, is the whole idea of teamwork, which the dean referred to. See, I, I think of architecture as a, like a football team. <laughs> that you need, you know, you can have a great quarterback that gets a lot of publicity. And a running back who's fantastic. I'm like Penn's team. Um, I'm joking. Um, and but you realize that they wouldn't win without the linemen blocking for them or protecting them. They wouldn't win unless somebody was making the tackles of the other team or receiving the, or the wide receivers who are making the catches. Teamwork is key in sports as it is in architecture. You know, we have a firm of 700 people. They all aren't partners. They all aren't designers. But they all work together. And they all contribute to the firm. So when we give credit, it's to the whole team. I don't take the credit. Bill doesn't take the credit. You know, yeah, Bill led the design, but he gives credit to the other designers who work on it. It's about the team. And we felt that was the right way to go. And so I will constantly mention the other people who really worked on these, because without them, we couldn't do the project. So you wouldn't have 700 people if, we, if Bill Patterson could do everything. Now, we happen to have 12 design partners, all very, very good. All, I mean, and there's a 12 teams. They actually operate as teams, project managers, job captains. All play a very important role. So when you work in a firm, even though you may not be the lead, you're still contributing. And when you have your own firm, when you do, you know, you're going to have a firm, not just you. It's got to be a team. So that was the whole idea. And the book stresses that, that the whole firm is built around the idea of team and the sharing of credit. And I personally experienced the other way around. I was a designer for Kling, Warnick, and a number of people. I never got credit. I won two National AI awards, and Vince would always get the credit. You know, he was the boss, and it was his right. Uh, and I said, well, that's not quite fair. Why? Well, you know, I did the design, but I, I didn't complain to Vince because I didn't want to lose the job. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, uh, for me, I learned then how I felt personally to do something and not get any credit. And so when I had a chance to give the credit, I do give it. And, uh, it's, and I feel better, and it's really good for the people on the team. So um, I'm going to end with two projects uh, that you probably read about a lot. One is Hudson Yards in New York, and the other is another t project we're doing in New York that I'll come to in a second. So how many of you have been to Hudson Yards? OK, well, then you, many of you know what it's all about. Uh, I'm going to be brief, but it's a, it's a fascinating project in that um, this is the site before anything happened. There, you can see the rail yards uh, there, and there. So this is the west site, that's the east site. And um, for initially, this site was considered by Mayor Bloomberg ideal for the Olympic Stadium for the 2012 Olympics. That's what he wanted. And New York worked very hard to try to get the Olympics. We didn't get it. And, um, but we would not get it because the stadium was not approved eventually by political forces um, and uh, for other reasons. In other words, one of the, I won't mention his name because he's now, well, it's, I will, Sheldon Silver, uh, wanted um, Mike Bloomberg to prevent any development of office buildings in this area until all the downtown where he represented the, uh, you know, the downtown area for downtown being the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, so the, area, the area that Silver represented, he didn't want anything to disturb it being leased, which was um, you know, where 9-11 had taken place and the rebuilding of that. Um, Mike said he can't do that. If somebody wants to build up here and develop offices, they're not going to prevent them. So the stadium didn't get approved. But I will show you what it looked like at some point here. 
Um, before I do, I take it back. The, uh, this area is called the was a, is now the High Line. It was a rail yard, a rail line that connected the factories within this area at one time. And um, while no trains were there, been there for years, it got to be a really garbage collection pit with grass. And um, but it, the idea of turning this into the High Line and a very beautiful landscaped area uh, has happened. And um, Jim Corner was key to this. The High Line did amazing things to the real estate. It drove the value of real estate much higher in the area. And as a result, um, that High Line that you see um, on this drawing um, included, in this case, was wrapping around the site of what is Hudson Yards. So where the stadium was, which is called WRY, and the, the High Line comes up to that, goes left to the river, goes up the full side of that, and then turns right and goes back almost to the, uh, to the 11th Avenue. So that was the, the High Line's relationship to Hudson Yards. And the only commercial side then was the east site, and the uh, west site was for the stadium. The stadium gets turned down, uh, but there had been a, comp well, here's the stadium. There had been a competition for Hudson Yards now without the stadium. And um, we, you needed a tenant in order to win. Couldn't win without a tenant. And we had, uh, at that time, Fox, uh, and they backed out one week before the competition was to be submitted. And as a result, um, we couldn't submit. And um, Steve was very upset, but that was it. And uh, Tishman Spire was selected. But Tishman Spire were not signed because each one of these sites was a billion dollars or two billion. Was it a billion or two billion? Remember, Mary? Well, you had one or two billion for that the site. You had to pay, put down. Uh, and certainly two billion for the two sites. And Tishman Spire said, well, in this, the, zone, the stadium site is rezoned. Uh, we're not going to put the money down. And the city said, well, you can rezone it, well, you know, but you have to put the money down now if you want to do the competition, you want, you want to take over the project. Anyway, they had a long debate. To make a long story short, they backed out. So there was no developer. And uh, they called Steve Ross of Related, who's now in China at this point in time, not now, but back then, and uh, asked Steve, he said, we'll give you one day. You have 24 hours to make a decision. Do you want to take over both sites now? Now, this took place in one of the worst economies, okay? Uh, the economy had gone down. There were no tenants available, hard to get money, and uh, this was 2008. And um, I'm not sure what you would do or I would do with that chance to, <laughs> to take that, but the risk was enormous. Steve decided to do it, and so he got selected to do uh, Hudson Yards, and then he had both the east and west site. We got the west site rezoned to, re to, to development, to uh, commercial. Um, meeting with Mike Bloomberg and Bill and myself uh, while the designs were being made. Anyway, to make a long story short, the project is pretty well done now. The, the west site, excuse me, the east site is complete. And uh, the tallest building is there, and you see that to the right uh, with its uh, cantilever balcony, so to speak. Uh, we've done four of the buildings here. And uh, Skidmore, I mean, Marilyn, how many? Was it two that you did? Remember? Uh, you, uh, I was looking for Skidmore. I, mean, I, mean, Skidmore, I think, has done two of the buildings here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, OK, good. Anyway, um, it's a, a very successful. Every square foot pretty much has been leased both of the retail and office. So that's really worked well. And uh, it was interesting because if you, I remember going to that site and saying to myself, why would anybody want to live here or work here? It was uh, tracks, buses were being stored, car wrecks. I mean, it was just a really a disaster along there. So I was totally wrong. And uh, uh, Steve Ross was right, and it's been a fantastic success. So it's almost 17 million square feet of space built now, and much more to go uh, when they do phase two. One of the lobbies of number 30, which is, uh, has the balcony, and um, they've had elements like this, the um, sculpture, uh, that's really become an exercise place. I mean, it's all stairs. It's really great. And, um, so you can uh, walk up and down all these stairs. It became a building, though, in the eyes of the city, and it required an elevator, and then you had to design it for the handicapped. And uh, so uh, it's, 
that's called the vessel. And uh, it's been interesting. So you're, if you haven't been here, you really should come to Hudson Yards. Uh, there's a lot of criticism of the planning. There's criticism of the, some of the buildings. But the reality is that it is a very great success uh, in terms of bringing people to here, both shopping, eating, and uh, working. Uh, and uh, I recommend it highly. This, this is kind of interesting. This cantilevered balcony overlooking the river and uh, Manhattan is all glass. So, I mean, there's a structure, but glass surfaces you can look through to the street. And the glass rails have no visible support. They're very thick glass that is structurally safe. But people I know are going to be a little nervous when they walk out. <laughs> and uh, look down, they can see the street, so. Uh, but it's very exciting. So that whole floor is a place where you have observed the city, you can eat and have, uh, buy and shop and see this phenomenal view of Manhattan and New Jersey. Um, one of my favorite buildings, while we've done three of these towers, and then the retail building, is this one to the left, number 55. Those recesses are visually are called loges. And we, instead of balconies, we recessed the balcony into the building, and it looks like this. So you can sit and enjoy the view, be part of the office environment, uh, and enjoy the weather when it's nice. Uh, and uh, it's been very successful. In fact, uh, what Steve did is gave each of the tenants their option they could have one or not. And it was very expensive to buy one, they would buy it and then create that space. So it's been very successful. One of the first buildings we did in the repositioning was this one called uh, China Metro Park, or Central Metro Park. Um, Metro Park is on the line between New York and uh, Philadelphia, as you know. And uh, this was a building that uh, was 70,000 square feet. And um, I wasn't sure we should bother with it, but the client was a nice person and said they wanted to redo something to it. So we said, well, okay, we'll do it. And uh, this is what we did. Uh, we took the upper floor and created a whole major floor that, with an interesting column that is both sculptural and structural, reskinned the building and created a, a handsome building. The budget was $19 million, I tell, and, and uh, the rents have skyrocketed, and uh, it's done very, very well. So uh, you can save and turn buildings around. For me, this building, number 390 Madison, is really fascinating. This building was originally built in the 60s, reskinned by Emery Roth in the 80s and um, had eight foot ceilings. So the developer said, I can't lease this building, so I'm Madison Avenue, but it had a problem. The problem was that if you tore it down, you would lose 150,000 square feet of space you couldn't repeat. It was over, it was built, the building existed was larger than the permitted zoning. If you tore it down, you couldn't build it back. So most developers do not want to lose square footage that they can lease. So they asked us to redo this building without losing space but I didn't want eight foot ceilings. So this is what we had to do. I mean, this is, this is like being a surgeon. We had to go in and remove floors, every other floor. We had to remove columns. We had to put new columns in, we had to put new foundations in, and then add floors to the top of the building and create a very high ceilings, in some cases 18 feet, um, to make the building have presence. And we get all, about, all, all the square footage back. How the city approved this, I'm not sure. <laughs> because it's a new building by now. <laughs> but, but we started by saying it's not a new building. We're just removing from floors and putting new ones on. Uh, but it's a major, I, mean, I wouldn't recommend this normally because it's very expensive. But they've leased the whole building. J.P. Morgan loves this building, has taken it. And eventually when the other, all the tenants leave, they're gonna have the whole building. So uh, it did work for them. And here's the actual building today. Um, it's a major building on Madison Avenue at 47th. So, very tough problem. It has unbelievably exciting spaces for dining, two-story floors in some cases, and uh, atrium. So this is another one that we're just finished called Hudson Commons, where a developer bought this existing building, and we've added this to it, and uh, created a really interesting space. Uh, and it's the top floor of the existing building just below the new space looks like this. And this is a fantastic floor to work on. We've had a Christmas party there, I can tell you. It's really spectacular. So, and then finally, uh, for me, this was one of my favorites. Uh, in LA, we were asked to redo or compete for, but not, we just interviewed for, uh, the Car Auto Car Peterson Auto Museum in Los Angeles. Anybody know that museum? 
If you're a car collector, you really know it. It's got some of the greatest cars in the world there. A few of them are $50 million uh, if you want to invest. But um, this was an existing building, really originally done by Welton Beckett as a department store, then converted by the museum with these fins to the museum. And uh, the, when we were asked if, to, to do it, they said you can't add space and you can't subtract space, which is really difficult. <laughs> How do you change it? And I'm not sure why, but it, it was a, a building that we could not add by zoning any space, and they didn't want to lose space. So I, 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 this, my, this was a fun project. We were being interviewed by the, one of the head of the museum in Italy at a place that I was renting for the couple of weeks, and we had uh, overlooking Tuscany in the valleys. And so we uh, had drinks sitting out on the outside, looking over this gorgeous countryside, and I pour the fantastic local wines, and we're drinking wine, and I take a napkin, and I just sketched it, and I did a series of these lines creating, uh, you'll see, here's the actual building. Um, these are all stainless steel, and they are the wind diagrams of these cars. So in some cases, they're very dramatic sports cars to more moderate uh, sedans, et cetera, but they're actually based on the wind studies over these cars. And so they became steel beams away from the building so that they didn't take, create space. And uh, it created a wonderful top floor, which is uh, you walk under those beams and it's really, looking through them to the sky is pretty special. So here they are in stainless steel. What we did was we took the existing building and put a red corrugated metal, and wrapped the building in that, and then took these stainless steel beams. And you know, this is like Ferraris. Uh, in a sense, uh, that was the inspiration. So it, they loved it, we got the job and uh, finished it. And uh, so uh, I'm gonna just flash through these really quickly. A Citic Tower we're doing, these are ch projects in China primarily. This is, this, this is interesting, that we designed it so they could relocate this building. I'm joking, I mean they fire the rocket and it could go to another, another uh, city. But uh, it's in Shenzhen and, and it's, uh, uh, their China Resources Headquarters, which has this unbelievable ceiling at the very top and a great space where they can entertain. Uh, this is really special. Um, TP Link is one of the great tech firms from China. We created a situation where we have two towers and the, everybody has two work areas. One where they can work privately at their own desk, even though it's part of a large space, or coming out into those curved areas or balconies in the atrium where their team, all teamwork, so they work out there in the teams in the atrium and they um, work in their workspace and inside the tower. In Israel, we're doing the Israeli tower, which is now under construction. Uh, and uh, if you go to Dubai, under construction is the Royal Atlantis. We've done it two, this year. Uh, a major, major structure where the crown prince has a major apartment there. You can see it under construction now. And uh, remember I told you about the Buffalo Airport? That was a start for airports. I felt we should do, we were very fortunate to get selected for the Dubai, for the Abu Dhabi Airport, which is the third largest in the world, and have created a place that's almost done now with arches that are 450 feet span and 150 feet high. So just imagine these are enormous spaces created and this is something they wanted. They wanted to put small buildings in the airport for staying, movies, dining, and make it like a city under this great roof. And uh, if you come to New York, you'll see now almost complete one Vanderbilt, which is the tower to your left in the screen. And that building um, is uh, not all glass, like many towers are. It has a terracotta spandrels, and uh, it's looking really very good. It's uh, has going to have one of the great restaurants, great spaces in the base, and uh, um, at the top, those upper floors have 20-foot ceilings and very special office space that you can rent at $200 a square foot. So, it's, um, and then observation deck at the very top overlooking all of Manhattan. And finally, here in Philadelphia, I was here last weekend to show, or last Monday, to present this. We're doing a residential tower, uh, very inexpensive compared to New York. Um, but called Art House. And it's uh, opposite the Kimmel Center on Broad Street, creating a, a gateway between the Kimmel Center, and you can see it in this drawing, the horizontal strength of Kimmel, the vertical 
uh, of this tower, which is 47 total floors, 44 floors of residential, and um, has great base with restaurants, et cetera. So it, it marks really the arts districts uh, of Philadelphia and becomes sort of a gateway to that area of Southern Broad. And uh, City Hall, you see the upper drawing, up, upper left of the drawing. And uh, it has brick, terracotta, and all glass. There are balconies for every apartment that are recessed, as you see here. Um, I can... can everybody see? I can't see the light, but... OK. Um, and it has marvelous amenities, almost 30,000 square feet of amenities including a 75-foot pool. And four major penthouses, which you see here, is a series of bundles stopping at different heights, creating these great terraces and penthouses. Um, they're a little more expensive than the other apartments, but actually uh, the rates are very low. I mean, $1,500 a square foot for a typical apartment. In New York, that'd be a steal. So <laughs> here it's very good. So. And finally, the book. So um, as Fritz said, the book is an interest, I mean, to me, it's, it's all stories, and it's like a novel, and it reads well. And, and Cliff Pearson, who's here with me, was a co-author with me, and we had a lot of fun doing the book. And um, if you have a chance to read it, you're, it's all about design, but it's all about people, it's all about management, it's all about leadership. It's about how you start a firm, create a firm, make it better, and pass it on. Because the funny is that is that we're now in transition, and there's new leadership in the firm, and um, we're growing in terms of partners. We're over 33 partners. And, uh, you know, barring a collapse of the, of the world economy, the future can remain good for the firm because we have fantastic people who've grown up in the firm, been with us 10, 20, 30, some 35 years now. And that teamwork, people sticking together. And, and I have to give Marilyn credit because uh, uh, Skidmore Owings and Merrill was a definite role model uh, for me. Because uh, we always used to have to compete with them, they beat us. And I said, we've got to get a firm that we can beat them. And, uh, and we did develop one that's really strong and doing great. So um, if you read the book, I think you'll get a lot out of it. So with that, I'm going to stop at this point and take any questions you might have. And then I think when we go upstairs, I can talk to you about anything you want, sports, uh, architecture. Uh, eh? So any, uh, anything down here, we can do it up above. Any questions? Well, good. I answered all the questions. Fantastic. Thank you.